Welcome to the panel discussion on the topic, how to get inclusive growth started in fragile contexts. I'm Kunal Singh, the director of UNU Wider. This event marks the launch of a new UNU Wider policy guidebook, Deals and Development, Fragile and Conflict Affected States, now available online and fully accessible on UNU Wider's website. The policy guidebook will be presented by Eric Worker, who's a William Sahel professor at the BD School of Business at Simon Fraser University, Canada, and non-resident senior research fellow in UNU Wider. The presentation will be followed by a panel discussion with five eminent experts, which will be chaired by Professor Patricia Justino, UNU Wider Senior Research Fellow, and an eminent scholar on conflict herself. By 2030, more than a half of world's, the world's poor will be living in countries characterized by fragility, conflict, and violence. Violent conflict, conflict has increased to the highest level in the past three decades. Broad-based growth has the potential of delivering a double dividend for fragile and conflict-affected states. Firstly, such inclusive growth processes can lift millions of the most dire living conditions that can be found anywhere in the world. Secondly, inclusive growth can lead to increased state capacity to deliver public goods that matter for development and contribute to the legitimacy of the state. By doing so, they can bring about political stability, an essential precondition for a country to exit out of fragility and conflict. Unfortunately, sustained inclusive growth that is politically legitimate is rarely observed in, in fragile and conflict affected states. So how does one get growth going in such states? In the policy guidebook, we provide a framework for understanding the concerns to growth in fragile states that takes as a starting point the premise that igniting growth in fragile states is not simply about fixing, fixing institutions. Technocratic reforms will not work if one is not sensitive to the political context. Growth and governance interventions are inextricably linked and need to go hand in hand. The guidebook is designed to help advisors working with development agencies as well as policymakers in fragile and conflict-affected states to analyze country contexts, their own country contexts, and design interventions with the goal of enabling positive growth episodes that reduce fragility. The aim of the guidebook is to provide actionable levers of intervention to bring about round reform and improve a fragile and conflict-affected state's chance of achieving transformative economic growth with end objective of building enduring peace and prosperity in the country. I will now invite Eric Worker to make his presentation on the framework and the policy guidebook. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Kunal, for the introduction. And thank you to everyone in attendance for uh, sharing some of your time today and looking forward to your insights on the challenge of inclusive growth in fragile, fragile states. So the, the work for this guidebook comes from a broader project that Kunal and I have been involved with, along with Lant Pritchett, uh, that we've been working on for a number of years, a project called Deals and Development. And in that um, project, we, we came together with a number of scholars from around the world and put together a framework and then a series of country case studies in which we took the framework and, and brought it to different countries around the world. And for that project, we started with three observations. The first is that the countries that we care about do not experience steady growth, the 2% per year that OECD economies like Finland or the UK might normally experience. Rather, what matters for those countries is growth episodes. In other words, a period of growth of five to 15 years in which a country grows at a normally consistent uh, clip. And if we look at fragile country, countries in particular, we see that they're the slowest average growers with the highest level of variance. In other words, even though they're growing slower on average, at any given point, some of the fastest growing countries around the world are fragile. And as Kunal mentioned, institutions can't drive economic growth in the medium run. Sure, institutions are highly correlated with GDP per capita, but if you look at whether institutions today can predict growth tomorrow, there's very limited predictive power. Looking at fragile states, for example, if we take the slowest growing and the fastest growing fragile states, they have almost the identical level of basic state functions. A third insight that motivated this larger project is that policies don't imply implementation 
As development advisors, we might work hard to come up with the right policy and suggest a law or set of regulations uh, for a, a, a lower income country. Uh, but what research has found by Lant and others is that firms don't actually face those rules, but rather a selectively enforced business environment. And that couldn't be more so than in fragile states. Go to the next slide. So what, what I'm going to present today is a framework that builds off the framework in this book, available, by the way, for free downloads on uh, o, uh, the OUP website, uh, in which we modify the framework to make it directly applicable to those who are working in, in fragile and conflict-affected states, building off the IGC report uh, that, that Adnan uh, Khan, one of our panelists today, helped to contribute to in which they identify a number of characteristics of, of state fragility. And at its heart, this is a framework that is a political economy model of business government relations. And there are five moving parts. And in the, in the guidebook and in this presentation, I'll briefly take you through those five different parts. But as you'll notice, we kind of, we, we bring on some of the, the latest research over the last two decades in political economy and development and try to bring that into an actionable space uh, that, that you as, as policymakers and advisors uh, can hopefully sink your teeth into. So there are, of the five moving parts, there's two that represent the political and the business interests. And those interact with one another to drive a set of government actions. The first set of actions is around the investment environment and the second is around investments in state capacity. And then together, those interests working through those government actions, along with any uh, external uh, uh, events or exogenous forces, lead to a growth episode. But importantly, that growth episode then has a feedback loop back into those original business or economic and political interests, as some constituencies are empowered by the growth episode, while others will recede in power. Next slide, please. So the first a uh, piece of the framework that I'll describe is the rent space, which is the variable that we use to capture the business or economic interests in the, in the country. And the key driving motivation here is that one shouldn't think of the private sector as a monolith with a single set of interests, but rather different firms have different interests and different demands on government, which will lead to different government actions in the future. And to simplify that a little bit, we divide the private sector into four different quadrants along two dimensions. The first is distinguishing what, how a business makes its profits. At one side, we have businesses that make their money through market competition, that is through a better good or service than other businesses in a competitive marketplace. And in the other side are those businesses that achieve their profits through discretionary government actions that lead to regulatory rents, such as allowing a monopoly to occur. And on the other dimension, are businesses in that country to sell stuff to the rest of the world using local factors of production, or are, are they uh, selling to the domestic market? So that gives us four types of firms. And just to take an example, workhorse firms, those that are in competitive sectors tell, selling to the domestic market, we're going to make demands of the state, such as for better rules, uh, more common infrastructure, as well as investments in, in people's education that can allow them to be more productive. In contrast, power brokers, those that are selling to the domestic market but gaining their profitability through, through regulatory rents, might actually benefit from a convoluted business environment that might show up as one of the lower ranked countries on the world's doing business uh, indicators. Uh, because that will provide barriers to entry that would allow them to, to take advantage of their unique relationships uh, with those in power. And looking to fragile states, we're likely to see a higher share of rentiers and power brokers, those firms that are likely to advocate for the types of, of policies that will not lead to inclusive growth. Uh, next slide, please. Our political interests is captured by the, the well-known construct of the political settlement that has been used in development circles for nearly two decades. Did John and Putzel summarize Mushtaq Khan's work in this space, uh, describing the political settlement as the balance or distribution of power between contending social groups and classes on which any state is based. 
Now, as an economist, I think of the political settlement as I, I sort of imagine a bunch of political actors who have what uh, Khan calls some underlying holding power. And you don't need 100% of all political elites in a coalition in order to govern. Rather, some, some subset of those will be governing and they just have to provide enough carrots and sticks to those who are on the outside to sustain that political settlement. Now, if we look at fragile states, um, one of the characteristics as, as mentioned in the IGC report is that violence or uh, by non-state actors uh, is, is present. And what we found uh, looking across several case studies is that rather than always leading to instability, violence can also help sustain a political settlement by allowing those who are inside to use uh, coercive action uh, in order to maintain uh, access to politics and also enabling the business actors who they can basically tap on to provide political finance in exchange for protection. A second feature of state fragility that's relevant to the political settlement is that societal divisions are more common in fragile states. And that just makes a political settlement harder to form and less stable when it's there. And next slide. So now we've got our economic or business and our political interests, which, which feed back with one another uh, by demands on government and then the needs of political actors to undertake specific uh, actions. And one of those areas in which they undertake actions is in the investment environment, which we capture through a concept we call the deal space. Here, recognizing that it's deals, in other words, firmer investment specific arrangements uh, that describe the business environment in, in fragile states. Now, we distinguish between ordered deals, that is deals that once made between a state and a, and a firm, for example, are likely to be honored once they're made and disordered deals. That is the interests will come together and the deal will only be in place so long as those interests remain there. We also distinguish between closed deals. That is deals that are only available to those who are uh, closely aligned with the regime and open deals that are available for anyone who's willing to play ball. An example of open disordered deals would be in the informal sector where small businesses are able to come and, and, and transact their business, perhaps as part of a, a membership in a, in a loose formed coalition with one inspector coming from the government in one week and another in a couple of weeks, but that doesn't allow those firms the sort of runway to be able to make long-term uh, and significant investments. What we find is that many of the deals in fragile states are both closed, that is only available to some, as well as disordered, which leads to a, a complex environment if you're looking to make more complicated uh, investments. We also find, however, that across the rent space or across the private sector, there are some industries that faced more open deals than others, as well as more ordered deals than others. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we've got our business and political interests leading to government actions in the investment environment. And then the second ca category in which uh, government actions are occurring are in investments in state capacity, specifically essential functions like infrastructure, education, and healthcare. Now in some takes on state fragility, where this is the common feature of state fragility of having low state capacity, uh, the problem is seen as one of lack of capability or ability. And in our framework, that couldn't be farther from the case. Rather, we see low investments in state capacity as a deliberate response to the political logic uh, of the business and the political elite. In the case of fragile states, there might not be a demand for it from business actors, power brokers and rentiers who, who dominate the, uh, the space in, in fragile states don't require more effective inputs of human or physical capital for profitability. Similarly, from the political side, the political settlement might be sustained through repression and patronage rather than competence and performance. If that's the case, none of the elite are really seeking to, do, to uh, increase investments in state capacity. Next slide, please. So now we've got our interests and our government actions which lead to growth episodes. And we're not just interested in the change in, in economic uh, growth or GDP per capita, though that's one of the features of a growth episode, would be the number of years and the average rate of economic growth of an episode. 
but we're also interested in two other features of the episode. One is the change in legitimacy that the government has to undertake what, what scholars would call coercive action. And then the other is this, the change in structural transformation that is going fr from producing fewer and simpler things to more and more complex goods and services. Now, our research in the book project showed that when we observe a growth acceleration, that is a growth episode that's suddenly fast or, or, or medium coming out of, out of a period of stagnation or decline, that that comes usually from a switch from disordered to ordered deals. In contrast, growth maintenance, going from one positive growth episode to another, tends to be driven by open and ordered deals. So in other words, what starts growth leading to order might not perpetuate, which is open. State capacity, we don't find necessarily as a driver of the GDP growth rate itself, as I mentioned earlier, but it's more likely to be involved in the legitimacy as well as the level of structural transformation as those are, those are investments in the underlying factors of production of, of capital and, uh, and human capital. Now, looking at growth episodes in fragile states, what, how could we make sense of observing a, a country growing at eight or 10% per year, and then uh, possibly seeing that country return to state fragility? Well, in our framework, there are what we call negative feedback loops that bring about negative consequences uh, for, for increase growth. So the growth could be driven by closed deals that are favoring Rancher and power broker firms, which themselves aren't demanding much in terms of uh, inclusive reforms from the state, leading to limited investment in state capacity. And then you have a growth episode with reduced legitimacy and no or negative progress on structural transformation. So if a country growing like this over five to 10 years, if you can imagine that feeding back into the business interests, we would see further empowerment of those same segments of the economy that are not demanding inclusive growth. And in the political settlement, reinforcing the existing status quo, which all will reinforce the drivers of fragility in the first place. Next slide. So we promised some, some uh, ideas for, for policies and, and I'll leave this to most of this to the panelists, uh, as well as if you'd like to download the, the guide and look, there's some suggestions in each of the different areas on, on potential policy interventions and also things to avoid. But let me just mention the first one here, which is to consider sector development activities in workhorse and magician industries, those in which businesses are competing against one another and the idea here isn't just to create new income per capita, which could be create some sort of social surplus, though that's a good thing, but rather the motivation in our framework is to create new constituencies, that is new business interests who will be in favor of inclusive reform, hopefully demanding improvements to state capacity and a more open deals environment. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Eric, uh, for such a thought-provoking presentation. Um, and thank you, Kunal, for the kind introduction. Um, for those of you that uh, join a bit later, uh, my name is Patricia Justino. Um, I'm a senior research fellow here at UNI Wider, and I have uh, the great honor of chairing the next panel with five exciting speakers and experts on this area of research. I'll, let me start by introducing them to you. Uh, first, we have uh, Adnan Khan, who is the Academic Director and Professor in Practice at the School of Public Policy at the London School of Economics. Adnan previously served as Research and Policy Director of the International Growth Centre and taught Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy School. We then have Aloysius Uche Urdu, who is a Senior Fellow and Director uh, of the African Growth Initiative in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. He held previous senior positions uh, with the African Development Bank and the World Bank. Our third panelist is Ang Hofler. Um, Ang is author of some of the most influential academic studies on conflict, and she's currently a Professor of Development Research at the University of Constance in Germany, where she holds the prestigious Alexander von Humboldt Professorship. In fourth, we have Frank uh, Busque, uh, who is the di uh, Deputy Director at the Institute for Capacity Development at the IMF. 
He was also previously the senior director of the World Bank's Fragility, Conflict and Violence Group. And finally, we're very happy to have with us uh, Mikol Martini. Uh, Mikol is a political governance advisor with the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in Somalia. Welcome all, and thank you so much for joining us for this important uh, uh, discussion on how to promote growth in some of the most difficult settings in the world. Um, I'm going to start this panel discussion uh, with Adnan and then follow uh, with the other panelists in the order of the introductions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a question to each one of you. And, uh, uh, and we agreed that everyone would speak for about five minutes. And in the meantime, all participants uh, and welcome for joining us, which I see you have a very large number of attendant attendees. Please add your questions to the Q&A function. Um, the chat is not working, so you need to add your questions to the Q&A. And I'll be monitoring those uh, during the panel and then uh, open up the discussion after all the panelists' interventions. So let me then start with Adnan. Adnan, we just heard Eric reflecting uh, on the challenges of establishing inclusive growth in conflict-affected and fragile countries. And you yourself have co-authored a very influential report on escaping the fragility trap by the LSE Oxford Commission on State Fragility Growth and Development. Based on what you have heard from Eric and your own work, what do you think makes economic growth and development initiatives so challenging in fragile states? Over to you. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me uh, and congratulations on uh, making a very important contribution. But uh, given the names on this, uh, on this report, um, Eric, Kunal, and Lant, uh, one couldn't expect any less. Uh, so thank you, uh, Patricia, for asking the question. Um, I don't need to motivate the question that fragile states are important. And uh, uh, but let me start that we know very little. We have a very limited understanding of uh, both about how to uh, generate uh, economic growth in developing countries in general, but fragile states in particular, and how to uh, go about the business of state building. It. So basically we are looking at a history of mostly failure. So, and it could be a failure of national actors, but I would also say in case of fragile states, it's mostly also a failure of international actors. Uh, the strategy that we have been generally following has not worked. Um, and in economic growth also, we have very limited understanding of how, what ignites economic growth, how it, it is uh, maintained, and uh, also in terms of thinking about a structured analytical framework for thinking about uh, um, episodes of economic growth. And that's why I think this, this book, particular book uh, makes an important contribution. Uh, we do have a, a, a large literature on economic growth uh, from Solo, the endogenous growth models and others. Uh, the question is how do we apply those to, to developing countries and especially the fragile countries where as Eric uh, mentioned, uh, the, the question of economic growth is inextricably linked to the other dimensions. It's a, basically a syndrome of fragility, uh, an environment where we have weak state capacity, weak state legitimacy. Uh, we have also have very limited private sector participation. And I will also say that like, uh, partly our limited understanding is because of uh, the flawed models or the like understanding that we have uh, about uh, about these countries and uh, uh, especially in coming to fragile societies and one quick uh, clarification i think uh, that's mentioned in the report is uh, some at least some of the international works uh, is obsessed about like this uh, binary distinction between fragile and non-fragile I was glad to see that the, the, the book, and we also do the, have the same approach, uh, thinks of fragility as a continuum, as a dimensions of fragility, and not just a, like an either or or a zero one uh, state. Uh, but it's partly also because although we have some technocratic knowledge, uh, in fragile states, it's, it's the reality of politics also, which, is, which has to be seen uh, with, the, with the, call it the technocratic knowledge that we have on economic growth. And that, that's where lies the, uh, especially in the policy implications of it, uh, 
lies most of the failure of how, how to kickstart growth. Basically, uh, what we have been doing is to infer how to kickstart growth or how to build a successful state from the current characteristics of successful states. What I would call the curse of Denmark. If Denmark has done it, it's a successful state, let's copy uh, Denmark. Now, Denmark hasn't become Denmark by being Denmark. It has gone through a very messy history of uh, making all kinds of adjustments, political settlements, adjustments uh, over a period of centuries. And ignoring that what I'm, is, is uh, completely counterproductive. What I'm trying to say is an approach that ignores history, initial conditions, and politics is not going to work. Uh, both history and initial conditions and politics are inextricably linked. And that's where I think this book makes an important contribution in, um, in uh, linking the literature on economic growth with the literature on, uh, on, on uh, politics and institutions, uh, both Asim Aglu Robinson, North Wallace uh, Weingast, uh, but also Dijon Putzel and, and Khan, and, and taking it forward and having an analytical framework that links those together. Uh, why this matters in practice, let me give an example. Uh, my colleague on the Fragile States uh, work, uh, Rafat Alakali, was a minister in the post-Arab Spring government in Yemen, uh, a government facing huge challenges, very limited like uh, legitimacy, uh, but also facing crisis. And there was a huge, uh, very high citizen expectations about what the government could deliver coupled with very limited capacity of what the government could actually deliver. And uh, the reason these uh, call it like these flawed frameworks could be so debilitating is uh, the government had resources, some resources, but they were asked uh, in this case by international community uh, to, to come up with, a, uh, with almost a perfect PPP law, a law on public private partnership before they could actually spend that money. And so uh, after a couple of years later, uh, after many, many iterations of that, uh, that law, yes, they came up with uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, I wouldn't call it perfect, but as close to perfect as they could get. But the perfect was the enemy of the good. By that time, they had lost their political legitimacy. Uh, the government was out of power by, by the rebels, who exactly used this argument, here is a government that doesn't deliver. Uh, and the, the, we, the rest, as, as you know, is history. I could go with examples like this from other contexts also. I worked in Africa quite a lot, South Sudan before the Civil War. Um, one of the major donors uh, was forcing them to adopt a carbon reduction as their core strategy. And at that time, so South Sudan had many other priorities as, as, uh, as you can imagine. And similarly, I, I can give examples from other contexts also. So, uh, I like this book with the with the uh, with the realism that it brings, uh, along with the with with the, with the framework, and also with the country state case studies. Um, to me, it's more of a case of like, given the messy world of uh, the, the politics, how do we think of uh, call it honorable growth enhancing political deals uh, that are actually honored in practice exposed. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. I, I like that quite a lot. I also have a couple of, uh, call it like questions or queries uh, or reflection points of reflection that I hope um, Kunal and Eric, uh, whether today or later could come up with, um, with something. Uh, one is this like, uh, this book focuses primarily on, a, on kickstarting and maintaining economic growth while taking the other dimensions of fragility as given, uh, uh, and I, so one question is, how do we think of this? Uh, how do the authors think of this, uh, this interaction between the initial condition, between the politics and the economics? Um, uh, this could vary at different times. Um, but uh, uh, in other words, how, how much can we do, can we maintain or think of this separability between uh, the other conditions uh, and uh, about the economic strategy, um, which could be growth promoting. Um, this could obviously vary with the, with, the, with the conditions. And I give you one example, so to make it maybe more complete. Um, one of the most insightful uh, testimonies in our commission on fragility came from the Tunisian minister, Hedi Larbi, in the post-Arab Spring uh, 
um, government where again they had very limited you know, government of national unity, limited legitimacy, um, faced by Islamists on the outside, huge pressure on them, um, uh, and very, very limited capacity to deliver. And how do we prioritize? And uh, many from the international and other communities came up with long list of things that they could do to promote growth, to promote like uh, other things. Uh, they had very, very, very limited uh, political space. They ultimately ended up doing something which was not on any of those lists, which was um, they ended up as their top priority for the next uh, limited time, few months, as cleaning the mosque. So uh, an agenda that the outsiders, the Islamists couldn't uh, object to, which gave them some political legitimacy. In other words, an example of doing something that gives them quick win, a uh, small step that gave them some legitimacy and some space that they could build on for doing longer term things. And I'm interested in knowing from, uh, from how do they, the, the authors think about this, like uh, the, the medium run growth strategy along with the, how do we build the political space for doing this. My last comment is more again along the same lines about um, the policy implications of their work, uh, which I, I personally find is quite interesting. Um, um, in other words, like uh, in thinking about how to move from an unstable, disordered pol and political environment marked by disordered pol deals to a stable political environment marked by ordered deals, um, what concrete actions can be taken by policymakers? Again, uh, the book talks about principles at the right, uh, which is the right approach because you can't have like a you can't be too prescriptive about how each country would do. I agree. Uh, I think that's the right. And the, the specific examples in the chapters go into more details. Uh, but even at the level of the principles, um, how do we think about like uh, uh, about about the policy space um, and who is the audience? Uh, what role can international actors and other actors can do, and what role can national actors can do? Uh, um, uh, which is also. Uh, I would also say the book, uh, and I think uh, um, Eric also mentioned a little bit, which is what concrete actions can be taken by insiders, both uh, both in normal times. Um, and here, my uh, this is more of an uh, like what I find quite useful is not only the framework that the book has used. Uh, I find all of those like fascinating and very useful, but also using a Bezle person framework of how do we build state capacity in uh, environments marked by, by fragility and how do we move, uh, escape the fragility trap by making specific investments and under what conditions different societies make those investments uh, in legal capacity and in, uh, in collective capacity in fiscal capacity and how does that promote economic growth? So some reflections along those lines uh, would be great. Let me stop it. Thank you. Again, I, I congratulate the authors for making a very important contribution. Perfect. Thank you very much, Adan. And you've made my life easier because some of the questions are um, also part of the questions I have for the panelists. Uh, also, we'll make Kunal's and Eric's life a bit easier also answering some of these. Um, let's then move to um, Aloysius. And, um, you have a wealth of experience working in some uh, of the contexts that uh, Eric and Kunal mentioned in their piece. And one of the issues that was emphasized in Eric's presentation is the role of elites, which also links uh, uh, to what Adnan just discussed as well. And I wonder if we could explore this a little bit more. In your view, how should state capacity be developed when um, Elites, elite interests may not necessarily uh, align with developing state capacity. There may, be, there may be an inherent interest in keeping state capacity low. What, what are your thoughts and in your experience, have there been any successful policies that could address this challenge, which is pretty prevalent in a lot of the context we're talking about? All right, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, let me thank um, uh, Eric for the presentation and of course, uh, my friend Kunal for inviting me to this uh, uh, panel. Uh, it's great to see the other panelists and, um, uh, uh, and to appreciate the point already indicated by uh, Adnan. Uh, first and foremost, uh, 
it, the topic we're dealing with today from the perspective of the African continent is a very, very serious one. Because whether you're talking of the IMF, you're talking of the World Bank, you're talking of the African Development Bank or any other institution, it's quite clear that the largest numbers of fragile states are on the African continent. This is clearly a very, very serious uh, uh, problem. Uh, the, Africa, the Institute of um, Security Studies in South Africa, for example, in their projection, estimate that by 2050, more than 1 billion Africans, about half of the projected population of the continent at that time, will be living in fragile states or situations of fragility. This is really scary. And it puts, you know, it, it is, it's quite numbing when we think of the issues that Eric outlined in the approaches in the book, which I found very, very helpful. And when you look at the fact that this many people are going to be living in fragile states of situations of fragility on the African continent. It has tremendous consequences, not just for the African continent itself, but for the global economy as a whole. Back in the 19th century, 12 million able-bodied Africans were marched out of the continent in slavery. Today, we have many, many African youths leaving Africa on a treacherous journey, many of them ending up in the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. And those who make it to Europe and elsewhere, the United States, et cetera, for in search of better life. Why are they doing this? A number of factors that, that encapsulated in the point Eric made in the book and with the other authors, state capacity is weak in their countries of origin. Take my own country, Nigeria. You know, where we, the, the concentration of fragility was the Northeast, you know, because of the problems with Boko Haram. Today, you see that fragility has moved, you know, from the Northeast of the country to the Northwest. And now there is also the challenge between the, the inter, you know, the nexus between climate change and, um, and, and uh, fragility. And as farmers move south, all kinds of insecurity. Whether you're talking of Mo Northern Mozambique, you're talking of the Central African Republic or the, 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 the central part of, of the continent. And of course, the Sahel as a whole. So this is the, the subject matter of this book is really, really important because for the continent in particular, uh, as I mentioned, the challenges are enormous and the, the, it's not obvious to me that we've found a magic bullet. I think your question is very clear that the interests of the elite. And I'm not even sure that we found a compelling example where the elites themselves have done something to, to address the issue of fragility. Uh, one that comes to mind, of course, is we, we, we go back to uh, 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 1994, when clearly, if you are talking of fragile states on the African continent, you could not not include Rwanda, right? But fast forward to today, you know, back to your question, no? you know, uh, uh, Patricia, fast forward to today, the elite, the leadership of the country, the, the recognition that state failure is the, at the heart, the institutional failure to deliver goods and services for the children, the women and men of these countries, that is at the heart of the whole thing. And so we could cite that, if you like, as an example of where elites have actually uh, 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 taken they seriously and transformed their country uh, by building basically institutions of governance, restoring institutions of government. If you take side by side next door with Burundi, where that has not happened, then anybody's list you, you, you care to mention on fragility, Burundi is included, but Rwanda is not. So that's directly to your question. So some of those characteristics in terms of armed conflict and violence that threaten citizens, the inequality, the exclusion uh, of a majority of the population, and of course, weak governance. You know, these are explosive cocktails, the so-called fragility trap or, 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 or syndrome, as, as um, others have referred to it. And I agree with Anand, particularly that history, we ought to learn from history. 
you know, important to consolidate state security. That's what we've learned from Europe as, and elsewhere. Important to build capacity. That's what we're also learning in the, as in the case of Rwanda, et cetera. The transformation to greater inclusion. These are all lessons of history from all world regions. But in Africa, all these things are happening simultaneously, okay? And the state is constantly under challenge. A couple of those challenges Eric mentioned, and I've, I see Frank is also here because most of the work he did, not to steal his thunder at the World Bank, you know, basically hammer home this point. You know, these countries are, these things are happening simultaneously. So where does Africa go from here? Is really the you know the, the question what to do? You know, first of all, fragility is not cast on cement, right? It's not cast on smooth because if you have domestic ownership and commitment, which is the starting point to move the agenda forward, uh, then things happen as you contrast South Sudan and say Rwanda, right? You know that domestic ownership and commitment is missing in South Sudan. Whereas that wasn't the case in uh, uh, Rwanda. The car, you know, there are other, you know, the, there's no shortage of what international financial institutions should do. In fact, many, many years ago in 2014, the African Com Development Bank itself under Donald Kaburuka uh, commissioned a panel, which was led by Ellen Johnson Salif at that time on what to do on the fragile states of the continent. Whether you look at uh, World Bank's own recommendations, IMF, every other, these institutions have made similar recommendations, which is where I find this book that Eric outlined today very, very helpful because the political economy dimensions often are at the heart of the matter. Uh, let me just end with one remark, and that is really a question for the authors themselves because there is this sense that um, we, we, we often see uh, fragility not as a, I mean, we, we see fragility as a category of states, we list them. But in my experience on the African continent, it's important that we don't see fragility as a category of states as such, but as a risk inherent in the development process itself. Because when I left Nigeria, Nigeria was not a fragile state. When I talk of my own country today, there are just situations of fragility, rearing its ugly head everywhere. So that as we pass through these development processes, what do the authors see, you know, as you know, in terms of the classification of the nomenclature, rather than here are a bunch of fragile states? Perhaps it's a it's, it's a risk inherent in development. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, we have plenty of examples of developed countries with pockets of fragility and conflict. Uh, but parking that for now, let me move to Anke. Um, Anke, you, you uh, researched many of these challenging topics for many years. And an interesting thing is, um, or maybe a trade-off that we might be observing here is in the literature, we often, uh, we often have shown that uh, adverse economic shocks can increase the threat of violence. However, um, can economic growth interventions reduce that threat since effectively higher economic growth may increase the overall pie, hence the rent space that Eric referred to, and potentially also increase the threat of violence from actors outside the existing political settlement? How do we uh, square the circle? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so this is a hard act to follow on Adnan and Aloysius. Uh, maybe he shouldn't have left Nigeria and it would have been more stable. So there's a question of causality here. Um, and of course, on the sidelines, I've sort of, I was still in Oxford when uh, Adnan and um, others um, um, we're busy with the LSE Oxford Fragility um, Commission and produced uh, a big report and also a lot of um, uh, interesting, interesting country studies. 
So what I liked about the the LSE Oxford approach and also so while I was in Oxford, um, Land Pritchard, so I, I became more familiar with Land's ideas on deals and development. So what I like about both approaches is that this isn't economists sort of solving a problem. Yeah. But because, you know, in economics, a lot of things are easy. Yeah, you need more investment in physical and human capital, you need technological uh, progress, and voila, you've got growth. I mean, we understand these models, yeah. But at the core of these problems, and this is what I like about these sort of fragility um, or approaches to fragility is our political problems. And unless we solve these and tackle these, we will not have growth. Uh, and in, um, so we need to work across the disciplines and really learn from each other what expertise everybody can bring uh, to, to the table. And I think the sort of complete dominance of economists in this area has got to stop. And I think these are very good signs, yeah, that, that, um, that people are opening up and sort of saying, okay, these are the problems we could usefully address, but there are other issues we need to sort of uh, open up on. So um, what I find also helpful as a, as a way of thinking about things is a very simple triangle that was um, proposed by uh, Sam Bowles and Wendy Carlin uh, published last year where they look at governments and markets. So these are the sort of main elements that you were talking about today, but then also this sort of um, uh, relationship to uh, civil society. And Adnan was already talking about this. Yeah, You need buy-in and trust, and you have to reinforce these sort of these, these deals that have to be honored. It's sort of, I honor a deal because I think you are trustworthy because um, it's a reciprocal arrangement. You know, you can't regulate everything. You need buy-in from the population, yeah, from, from civil society. And how do you do this? Well, um, different things will work in different places. And Adnan already cited the, the Clean the Mosques uh, in initiative, yeah, um, that incidentally also didn't cost very much. Yeah, so it isn't necessarily about investing a lot of a lot of money. You need to find an entry point. So, what are the main functions of a state? Yeah, so a state has to provide security, and a, a state has to provide something that enables individuals to lift themselves out of poverty. And of course, these two things are interrelated. Yeah, and a lot of people are you know, um, coming in rickety boats and um, try and cross the Sahara Desert and um, are being terribly traumatized, even those who make it and don't die on the, on the way, they are enormously in debt to their own families, to other people, have been very often brutalized um, um, dur during their, their journey. And why are they coming? Because they neither have peace nor prosperity where they come from, yeah? in to varying degrees and incidentally of course you know this sort of like continuum of fragility is 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 an important way of thinking about it okay but for me at the core of this is really how do you get security and in post-conflict situations you very often have an opportunity a window of opportunity to have um, security sector reform because very often the army and the police are part of the problem, they're not solutions to the problem. So you need to sort of start there, but none of these security sector reforms can be successful unless they're embedded in a wider political um, um, agreement here. Yeah. Um, now, rebuilding an army so for example uh, in Somalia the army isn't really totally on the state side yeah there are a lot of um, inf there's a lot of infiltration um, you don't have an army that really wants to fight al-shabaab al and so you won't really get um, uh, security here so but in principle um, you should be able, in, in terms of building an institution and building it on merit, the army should be a good starting place. Yeah? Um, 
um, because soldiers, you, you can, um, you know, they have to be young and fit and capable of, 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 of fulfilling these, um, these tasks. So it might be a very good exemplary institution within your state apparatus, um, because I mean, virtually every country has got a standing army um, to, to sort of instill the idea that um, they should be recruited on, on merit. Um, police is very often much more problematic in fragile countries. Typically they are over armied because the, the worry about the elites is always that they will be toppled over. So the, the, the army has got a slightly different role to how we would maybe like to have it in a, in a non-fragile situation. Um, the police is very often seen as, as corrupt and incapable of sort of or in, unwilling to, um, to stop um, to stop violence, and this can be very dangerous because if you look at Latin America, there the danger doesn't come from armed conflict any longer. I mean, it used to be a big problem, but it comes from within. It's a hollowing out of the state. It's the narco trafficking that is so um, um, lucrative, you know that, um, and you can't really do it without help from within the state. And um, you know, parts of West Africa are already there, I think, you know, where um, uh, you can't, re you know, where there's a lot of trafficking um, of, of um, illegal drugs going on. Okay, so the question was, so it's quite clear that these adverse shocks, as we've also heard from Aloysius, um, adverse shocks give you armed conflict. We've done lots of, lots of people have done research on this, but the there's an asymmetry. So if we've got growth, do we then, I think there's an asymmetry, sorry. Um, so if we get growth, do we then stop the whole process? And I think that's unfortunately less likely to be the case because in a lot of, uh, let me stay with African countries, a lot of African countries have seen growth because of primary commodity booms. And that does not give you that sort of inclusive growth um, and it also doesn't give you a good opportunity for policy reform. Policy reform happens in, in times of need, not boom. And so I think, um, you know, you shouldn't let a good crisis go to waste, as the um, silly joke goes, and um, sort of try and, and, and uh, um, so in a sad way, this doesn't help you um, to sort of generate, you know, that this growth that came more or less from a global um, perspective to help you with your more localized problem. Let me end on one thought that I find quite important to discuss. As we are going forward with greening our economy and digitalizing after this pandemic or through this pandemic and after the pandemic, we will need a lot of natural resources, um, so rare earths, they're not rare, it's just uh, they are everywhere in the world, but you just pr profitably mine them in a few places. And for all these lithium batteries, there are quite a few places in Africa where there's going to be more mining. And that might be very good for global climate change, but it might cause even more local instability. And I'd like us all to be mindful of that and address these uh, issues as we move forward to greening uh, the global economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anke. And uh, I'll park for a moment your point uh, about growth and come back to that in a minute. But let me now move to Frank. Um, Frank, uh, you led the World Bank's Fertility Conflict and Violence Group at the time when the bank moved more decisively towards working in these critical, difficult environments and, and now at the IMF. In your view, what is the role of development partners, including multilateral donors, in promoting growth and stability in this context? And what can effectively be done to support economic growth or different types of economic growth, as we just heard uh, discussing, without increasing the risk of violence. I'm not sure I will have the answer to these questions, but uh, thank you very much, Patricia, for inviting me. Very happy to be uh, at this event, joining some uh, uh, old colleagues, uh, not all by the edge, but uh, from the provenance and institution. So very happy to see you all, really. Now, two quick points I would like to make. Um, and by the way, I actually fully agree with many, many points that have been raised before. 
I think the whole point about the fragility trap, the whole point about having a tailored approach, looking at drivers of fragility, not making some assumptions that make sense in some uh, less fragile context, uh, I will come back to it. So I just want to already say where I stand uh, on this on this notion. Humility is also important. Uh, I don't think, I think we unfortunately have more uh, failures and difficulties, at least in the short, medium term, uh, than, than success uh, and recognizing the leadership and the momentum, like Professor Colley used to say, is actually critical. So already, so that you know where I stand here, are basically the, some of the key principles that I think are quite important. Uh, two quick points, because I, I think it was a little bit raised by Alusius, but I'd like to come back to it, especially at the time of, of COVID-19. I mean, if you look at what happened over the past uh, decades, you really have a level of violence uh, that have been at their 30 year peak. You really have, we have about today, 80 million people that are forced displaced. Uh, I think the last statistic that I saw is that the world population living 60 kilometers you know, from a major conflict event had doubled uh, to 220 million since 2007. So the situation was actually uh, quite already serious. Now with COVID-19, it's actually even worse. When you look at uh, the conclusion that we just did some internal analysis, you have date, uh, debt and inflation that are really rising. I have the numbers here, public debt in fragile states, rose by almost 16 percent points to 76 percent of GDP last year. And the debt uh, as well have been increasing in all those countries. So the whole point is that today, and that's why this event is so timely, fragile states, and I will come back to the definition and categorization as well, uh, are, but in any case, whatever list you take, they are really at significant risk of falling behind non-FCS. Uh, and it's not only about uh, economic aspects, it's the whole point is that you have uh, countries that are impacted by fragility, conflict of violence or active conflict. They really have a new threat posed by the COVID-19, which is exacerbating some current grievances, inequalities uh, and gaps in institutional uh, capacity. So really the key question for all actors today is how to help authorities, countries to build back better we can talk about green recovery. We can talk also, also about inclusive growth and making sure that we tackle key grievances. Uh, I think it was mentioned uh, just now by Anchor. It's during tough time that you also can take some uh, focus on some on some key key reforms. But just on these notions about a categorization, fragile states, non-fragile states. I think actually the key point is for national and for uh, international actors is to focus on those countries that are not yet fragile. Uh, looking at Burkina Faso eight years ago, uh, which was on no list, uh, whatever list you can consider, but basically you could see that definitely there was a potential for increase in inequalities. And when you can look at the end of the day, all the non-state actors, Islamist groups, uh, they are coming to a space where there is actually a lack of support from authorities and a lack of social contracts. And therefore very important to look at this early warning system, to look at this trend in inequalities. It's not only poverty, we know it from the Arab Spring. I think it was mentioned when you mentioned also uh, what was done by right, with Edil Abi in Tunisia and so on. And the whole point is to say, how can international actors not focus just on fragile states, but focus on the non-fragile states and look low income, middle income, what are some of the trend and how can different actors with different mandate can actually focus on those issues before it leads to an escalation of violence and conflict. So you see, I'm not too much into where we have a list that's really the, the key list to be adopted worldwide, the opposite. There is a continuum, obviously it goes low income, middle income. Why do institutions, some institutions have those lists to make it super clear? Because at the end of the day, it helps to focus an institution on a specific set of countries that really have, as we have heard right now, a different type of issue. When there is no security, no rule of law, significant government challenge, Yes, this actually requires a tailored approach. And that actually leads me to my last point, which is to say, what does it mean? It means that in this context, very important to recognize the importance of the drivers of fragility that need to be embedded when you design program. Uh, the bank, uh, as you may know, is now uh, asked to carry out what we call risk resilient assessment in all fragile states. This is good because at the end of the day, you need to ensure that when you design program of development, but I will say also financing program, from the fund and other key actors, you are going to fully understand what are the source of resilience, what are the key drivers of fragility. At the end of the day, it's not only about macroeconomic stability, it's about inclusive growth and helping countries to exit fragility. And the whole point is how can we better tackle all international actors, those key uh, drivers of, of fragility.
Um, I think there are a few uh, about the point about tailoring the support, and that's why there is some list. It's also recognizing the importance to adapt uh, the, the support to the environment. When you look, and that's really the whole point about you know tailoring. So it means that, for instance, when you are going to have uh, 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 the need for reform, you need to obviously look at gradual pace for fiscal adjustment that will need to take into account the capacity, the vulnerabilities, but also what are the costs needed for cohesion building initiatives. So the whole point about focusing on those countries in the, at this time is actually, like I was mentioning, Professor Collier is always insisting rightly on it, is about looking at the pivotal times. A reform may be good, but may not be actually the right recommendation at this time. And therefore, trying to better understand, again, the political economy, drivers of fragility, and that's why cooperation between all actors, even humanitarian actors, the bank, the fund, bilateral agency, is so important to have a well-informed and good understanding about the situation on the ground and be able to have a tailored approach when uh, pushing for reforms or providing financing. Uh, so I will just stop here, but I think uh, my message is threefold. One, today is actually getting worse with COVID-19. It's not only in terms of economic situation, it's actually in terms of exacerbating inequalities. So we talk a lot about divergence, divergence between countries, but also within countries. And my second point is to say more and more, and very happy to see this, you see more about the importance of humility, recognizing the importance of partnership, meaning having more presence on the ground, making sure that we focus more on the how and not the what, making sure that we can leverage assessment for other organizations, especially focusing on the political economy, drivers of fragility, and ensuring that we have a tailored approach, meaning that fully consistent of uh, this recognition of the situation on the, on the underground and the different constraints that countries are, are facing and something that could work very well in Denmark, which was mentioned, that's why I mentioned again, may not be at all appropriate at a specific time from another countries. Uh, let me stop here at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. And picking up on those points, uh, let me now turn to Nicole. Nicole, um, the FCDO country office in Somalia has, I, I assume, to grapple with these difficult questions at a very practical level on a daily basis. And therefore, pragmatism may be more important than um, ideal policies, uh, which is a point that has been made by almost all panelists. Uh, all panelists have also uh, mentioned by now the, the issue of quality of growth. In your opinion, is there a difference between good growth and bad growth in the sense of growth that leads to a further reduction in political legitimacy and state capacity? And can we prevent bad growth at all? Or are there shades of bad growth that we can support provided that violence can be prevented? Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that great and very uh, tricky question and also to Kunal and Eric and the team for inviting me to participate here. I think much of what I will say about this um, really picks up on the excellent points that have already been uh, very eloquently made by the panel so far. I mean, I think the fundamental thing to say here and really is picked up very clearly in the framework uh, that that Eric presented is that um, growth, of course, uh, can be can be bad um, in that it can be part of a system that retains instability. And I think this is the sort of fundamental point um, that I would want to make, which is that growth is essentially a reflection of existing political behavior. I think Adnan made that point as well. It's not separate from this, but the deals on the table both drive and then in turn are driven by these dynamics in this sort of mutually reinforcing set of relationships. And so we should probably not be all that surprised that where political dynamics are unsettled and benefit from instability, that growth is a part of why that is the case. Um, in trying to think about this and the sort of work that we've done in this space, I think there are sort of, uh, over, I, I would suppose, a number of overlapping circumstances or sort of criteria, and these are picked up very well by Eric and others, that when our present, when our present together would give a pretty good indication that a context is in this sort of negative feedback loop domain. So I think the first and these have been said already, but is the presence of a sort of narrow elite bargain or a political settlement that is pretty unformed where elites are still vying for control. Two, where governance structures aren't really accountable to the public, where citizens aren't the main source 
of legitimacy per se. Uh, three is where a security apparatus is very fragmented or where elites um, or private actors can deploy violence as a tool. Four, where the state is new, is very weak, or where you're dealing with a rentier state, um, which is certainly the case where I work. Uh, and finally, where you see these rents clustered um, in so-called power broker and rentier growth sectors as articulated in this framework without real scope for deriving profit from more competitive growth areas. I recognize there's probably other criteria, but I think when these things overlay, these are big red flags that we should be really paying attention to. And in these contexts, growth is probably a source of contestation and maybe generating rents into a system that is going to disincentivize, disincentivize the opening up of the political settlement or the establishment of the rule of law. And I just want to touch briefly, as you mentioned, I work on Somalia where I've worked for uh, four years most recently, but in total six years. Um, and I think this is really well illustrated in the Somali context. I mean, here you see rents very much clustered in these natural monopolies. Uh, uh, and there's a sort of fragile elite bargain, which is predicated essentially um, on a division of spoils and a sort of clan-based power sharing arrangement, which agrees sort of ostensibly that dominant clans will enjoy relatively monopolistic control over rents in um, relative geographic territories. And those parties to this agreement, you know, more or less have arrived in this because they have the ability to use and deploy violence. Um, the state can't really check that. I think Anke made that point about Somalia, but in fact, uh, the state is actually often uses what limited access it has to a security apparatus to fuel these internal squabbles and shore up its own control in the system. So any rents that elites can seize upon really reinforce a desire to avoid establishing the rule of law or the sharing of power beyond this narrow group. Um, I should just say quickly that this context is particularly marked by the presence of Al-Shabaab, which isn't always true in fragile states and is a powerful actor that plays into this political economy. And the sort of cumulative effect is that this essentially prevents um, and constrains in any really practical way, any means for competitive or productive growth. Um, and that reinforces this reliance on the capture of rents. So in Somalia, fragility, it's not a consequence. It's retained with intent by these vested financial interests and it's secured to the use of threat of periodic political violence and conflict. Um, and so I think um, that kind of brings us to this question of so what, what can we do about it? I mean, I think the question of prevention is really tricky. Um, where you see most of these dynamics, you're probably already uh, in the pot boiling. And it's a question about how we incrementally make things better. I, I think um, Frank's point about humility is really important. There are no easy wins here. It's, it's literally systemic. Um, but I guess just to offer a few thoughts um, as we have been trying to think a little bit creatively about these things and I know others are as well. I mean, I think first, cause there are no easy wins, um, we, we need to really be good at and better at making sure our ambitions are realistic. Um, in the context where we engage, do we have actually not just a good sense of what Denmark looks like, but what that next incremental step would look like? Do we have a vision for that ourselves? Um, I think the second point is just to think about, um, you know, as we have these visions around trying to break away from these negative feedback loops and diversify into more competitive sectors, this really needs to be done in recognition of these underlying power dynamics because if they're not addressed and worked with and through, they can create new sources of conflict. Um, I think the third thing is that in places where these entrenched dynamics exist, um, an important bit of this is to keep a keen eye out to opportunities that may emerge, but recognize that these will come with risks. And I keep thinking about the energy transition in particular, and others have mentioned this. I mean, that could be an opportunity in forcing elites to look for new sources of generating rents, and particularly in resource dependent conflict, uh, affected states, but equally that transition may encourage even shorter term rent seeking behavior. Um, the next point I think I would just want to make is around um, uh, thinking about whether there are entry points uh, to reduce constraints placed in more competitive sectors. Um, you know, for instance, overlapping uh, taxation, international sanctions and trade regimes, security challenges, all of these may constrain more competitive sources of generating profits. Um, themselves. So there may be entry points there. 
Um, I think there's also within this and linked to this a point about revisiting and sense checking the role of the state itself and how we approach the sort of project of state building, um, which can play into and exacerbate this dynamic. And finally, I think I would just say, you know, there are big questions in this space. I think others have said this, but I think there's just a fundamental question about, you know, is this pernicious cycle just part of a longer uh, non-linear but ultimately progressive process um, or not? Are these bad growth feedback loops actually perhaps not viable for the state in the longer term? And then I think there's a question to all of us is whether we are structured and set up and incentivizing ourselves in our own institutions to continue to ask those questions um, and make these assessments in a more kind of collective and collaborative way. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much and thank you to all for these great interventions. Uh, we're actually running a little bit um, late, but then we have a lot of questions. So um, what I thought I would do is uh, compile the questions into sort of groups. So apologies if I'm not asking exactly the same question that you've posted, but I'll try to compile them into uh, uh, topics that will be manageable for the, for the speakers. And uh, then I will uh, do uh, give the uh, pass on again to uh, Eric and Kunal to react to both the questions from the participants and from the panelists, and then give everyone the opportunity to sort of come in and pick and choose whatever questions you'd like. So I can see sort of three three broad areas of questions here. One, uh, and it was asked for quite by quite a few people, is about the prerequisites for fiscal and monetary policy mix and also support for other sectors, for instance, uh, uh, SMEs and uh, other sectors. And what are these prerequisites? And I guess this is also a question about prioritization and policy sequencing, as pointed out by Adnan. Uh, so I was wondering if we could uh, reflect a bit more on that. There is also a question about COVID, and I think it was Frank that already brought this issue into the discussion. I mean, we sort of, as, as a response to the UN Secretary General, we saw a series of, uh, of uh, peace accords coming up, uh, ceasefires coming up immediately after the start of COVID, but by October, November, conflict had returned to previous levels and it's probably getting worse now. At least in certain areas, that's what the data is showing. It's getting worse. Violence is increasing. And this is because it's opened the opportunities, uh, several opportunities to armed groups and, and various uh, groups outside the political settlement. Are there also opportunities being open for inclusive economic growth in a situation like this? What's the role of COVID in, in, uh, uh, in promoting certain types of growth in fragile countries? And uh, finally, uh, there is a, actually quite a relevant question here on corruption and a uh, point well made that corruption is multidimensional, as we know. What are your thoughts about the direction of causality between corruption and fragility, both corruption within the country and also spillovers from, I guess, uh, neighboring uh, uh, countries or, uh, or others in the same region? I think this is a lot for uh, Eric and Kunal to absorb, so maybe we give them now the space to address all these issues and then um, maybe uh, uh, all the panelists then can have a, a few words about any of these issues that you'd like to pick up uh, on. So Eric, do you want to go first or we could pass on to Kunal too? Uh, sure, let me say uh, three things. Uh, in brief, there's so many excellent points raised and, I, and I'm so grateful to our panelists and uh, to our attendees for these really rich and interesting questions and, and discussions. Um, let me just say, say three things. One is that um, kind of around what, what is success uh, in this framework and, and I think it was raised by a number of, of the panelists. Uh, and, and in our framework, it's a very simple one, which is can you achieve growth that's uh, positive, but that also brings about incremental improvements uh, with, a, with a, I guess, a barely positive feedback loop. Because the one generates increasing prosperity at the, at the individual and community level, and then the other reduces the drivers of fragility. And that would apply whether a country is labeled fragile or whether it's not labeled fragile, but it still has those same underlying political uh, dynamics. 
And a second, which is um, kind of uh, representing the, the humility uh, that, that we bring to it. It's hard in, in 15 minutes to, um, to communicate that, but essentially if, if you spend more time with the, with the framework and, and with the larger book, uh, it's what, what we try to offer is more of a framing, more questions than answers. So you get folks like Mikol who go into such a uh, level of detail and insight that, that the initial framing just can't do. And it's to stimulate the types of questions and conversations and ideally work across uh, disciplines as Anka mentioned uh, that can generate those real uh, local understandings of what the solutions uh, might be. Um, let me turn it to Kuna because I'd like to hear from our panelists as well. Okay, so let me actually, thanks so, uh, uh, thanks so much, Eric and Patricia. Let me actually go and address uh, Adnan's uh, brilliant question also, what Alas has also asked also on the framework, because I think this is really important and it cuts across on the discussion going on here. First, uh, uh, Adnan asked that, um, do we see legitimacy and growth enhancing investments or policies separate? That's a great question, because we haven't really spent too much time talking about this in the framework, and Adnan, you're right. But, and one of the things we try to do in the framework is say, look, you as an economist as a, or a growth advisor in FCD or any or an economist working in, in the multilaterals, you should not see yourself as an economist prime in, in RNC fragile states and think also outside the box when you look at what we need to do. And the example you gave about legitimacy enhancing action in the case of the, the example you gave is a great example of how one should think outside the box because legitimacy, legitimacy enhancing actions help growth going because you lead, it leads to more political stability, which is very important for getting audit deals on, on, on the table. So I think the point that I think we were trying to do in this, in this uh, policy guidebook and the work that we've been doing previously is to try to get the growth and the governance and the humanitarian advices in different agencies think together and work together because you cannot do this on your own. And I think that's a very, so the example you gave exactly what I think should lead to that kind of discussion among agencies working on fragile states and thinking through thinking also the box. The second point you made is, how do we move from a disordered deals environment to an ordered deals environment? And then of course, let's just raise the question of the example of Rwanda. And I think one critical thing we know, and this is not just the example of Rwanda, if you think about many of the success stories we have in the developing world, the South Koreas, the Chinas, more recently Bangladesh, they had incredible periods of Indonesia, incredible periods of conflict at the beginning of their development process. But they resolved that and they moved on. How did they do that? And one important lesson we can draw from all of the stories is that how the long-term horizons of the political elites get elong gets elongated, it, it gets extended. So they can start thinking outside, what kind of gains are we gonna get from the rents in the next few months, next years, to thinking about how can we get this, our, our country going for the next 10, 20 years, right? So that process of, of extending the time horizon of elites to see beyond the short-term gains from the rents that they might see in the economy now to looking at what might happen 10, 20 years from now is a very important transformation that we've seen, for example, in Rwanda. Now, how do we get that going? How, do, how does that happen? Very difficult to say. And perversely, actually, sometimes it might happen in a way you may not want. In other words, suddenly the rents from oil might dry out. And suddenly, the, or any other natural resource might dry out. And then you might say, oops, we have a problem. What we were seeing in the short-term extraction, extraction of the getting of these rents is not possible anymore. Let's think about something else. So in actually sometimes crisis generates this kind of movement towards long-time horizons of edits. And that's why I think we should also think of crisis as an opportunity and maybe even the pandemic could well be an example of that, of how that can actually lead to a extension of the time horizon of edits, exactly as Adani mentioned, the basic person work on how cohesive political institutions can be formed. So I think it's a really important point. And I don't think that there are good enough examples yet of how this can happen. Horizons of elites going much beyond the short term towards the long term. But I think we need to think about how that can happen and how the international community itself can try and trigger this or trigger at least help and enable this kind of processes. So I think that's really important. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that I think the thing that's really, really, I think came across in the discussion uh, so far is that initial conditions, history, all that matter are, are very important. So we need to understand initial condition history very, very carefully because each of the success stories you've seen so far when you moved out of fragility itself 
There are many very specific issue conditions and historical conditions that allow this to happen. And we need to understand that. And in other words, no one country that has moved out of fragility in the, in the last 30, 40 years is, is the same as the other, other country. Each of them are different in their own way. And I think that is very important for us working in this, in this area and the space to understand because often as economists, we don't, we don't think about those issues. And I think we think about a one size fits all, all model, which simply doesn't work. So I think that's the thing, I think that's our things, which I think hopefully we are trying to contribute to in this, in this, in the policy guidebook, make us think through outside the box, think about trying to bring growth, governance, humanitarian advices together in one place, not as silos, thinking through together in one way, how do we get growth going that is politically legitimate, legitimate that it can enhance its capacity, that can transform the, the economy in a way that's absolutely can think about growth for a longer term, not just for a short term. All of those things are very important. And I think that's what one of the things that I think Eric and I were really wanted to do in getting the guidebook out to get this sort of conversation going. And I'm really excited to see that has happened to, to some extent in the panel so far. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you very much, Eric and Kunal. Um, before I pass on to all the panelists, because we have literally five minutes left, just to highlight, there are questions here that we will pass on to Eric and Kunal on um, the difference be between internal drivers and external drivers. Can we reflect more on external drivers? Uh, how do we define inclusive growth in fragile states? Is there, are there measurements that are new and uh, coming up as well? Uh, how do we define fragility? So lots of questions around all these important def uh, areas around definition and also how do you sort of extend the framework as well? So we will pass on uh, all of these uh, to Kunal and Eric, very grateful for all these uh, questions. Uh, but now let me give um, the panelists 30 seconds each for uh, final, <laughs> final comments uh, on uh, how to, to promote inclusive growth in uh, conflict affected and fragile countries. Why don't we go in the reverse order and start with Nicole and then go around Frank, uh, Anke Haloises and Adna. Nicole. Uh, sure, thank you. And I should say I, my internet unfortunately cut out just when you were asking those questions, but I thought there were some really interesting questions I saw in the chat around the international drivers and the regional dynamics. And I just want to say that, you know, these are systems within systems. And I do think when we start to think about these interconnectivities, we need to start to also parse out the extent to which there are these regional and international drivers that, in, that also benefit from these stable instability dynamics um, and whether we are piecing those together. So when we talk about, and I really agree with this point that Eric and Kunal emphasize about working more systemically across our areas of specialism. And I think also getting to that place where we're expanding that to a more regionalized or internationalized approach. There isn't this false dichotomy between these states and then everything that surrounds them and the, and the sort of global north. But I think they're sort of part of these systems. So working in more in greater totality um, is something that I also am really interested in doing. But just a big thank you for, for this been really interesting. Thank you, Frank. Just uh, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Now, just to come back on the COVID-19, because you know we can look at potential for reform, and but we need to keep it very clear as well. I, mean, I was trying to make the point that COVID-19 is having a devastating impact in those fragile states. They already had uh, existing vulnerabilities. They have less capacity than other states to manage shocks. Uh, and clearly, this is this notion of compound risk. I mean, we clearly uh, see it in, in Somalia. Anke knows it better than anybody else, where you have the triple shock, locust, COVID, and floods. So basically, I just want to make it clear that, you know, recovery in those countries is going to be protracted. It's going to take time, and it needs support more than ever. And it's about concessional financing. It's about grants. But also, it's recognizing, which was exactly the whole point about Eric's presentation, that it's not, uh, it has to be fully adapted it has to be tailored, understanding the leadership, the momentum, and the importance of design program that will be addressing this source of resilience and drivers of fragility. Uh, and we can talk more about what does it mean in terms of fiscal adjustment, in terms of reform. We got some feedback from Adnan and others, which are really in line with the key recommendation that we share as well. Let me stop here. Thank you. Uh, Anke. 
Thank you. I'd also like to pick up on the opportunities that we will hopefully see through COVID. So let me make three quick points. Um, so first of all, COVID, of course, exposed existing weaknesses. And in some countries, there's little trust in the healthcare system and um, um, little capacity to sort of deal with the donated doses. So, for example, um, yeah, there were a couple of countries where uh, lots of doses were actually incinerated. But then there were also countries um, like Malawi, but there were also countries like Ghana, okay, not a fragile state, but, you know, they used drones to sort of get the vaccines to remote areas. And uh, vaccination programs in the past in, in Africa have been very successful, yeah, for example, uh, polio vaccination and so on. Um, so uh, let's be hopeful, you know, that with donation from 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 the outside, you know, this um, uh, pandemic is also going to come to an halt in 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 Africa. So it does lower income. Patricia and I are part of a study in um, on a worldwide COVID study. I've put it in the in the um, Q and A section here, uh, lifewithcorona.org. Um, so we we know that this is really hard hitting for people. So what sort of um, cash transfer programs can we think of? So for example, the United States has now got a sort of child uh, benefit, yeah, universal child benefit for the first time. And that's also been, you know, made possible through through the crisis, I think. So let's think of ways how we can sort of support people. And then last one is that COVID has brought about quite a few policy experiments. So for example, countries have restricted movement, but they've restricted all sorts of other stuff as well. For example, alcohol say, sales. And we know that violence has gone down. So let's think a little bit more about these sort of public health implications beyond um, beyond the virus. But this has been uh, excellent to connect with all, all of you. And also, I saw so many interesting uh, comments in the, in the chat. Yeah, So please reach out to us. We're, most of us are on Twitter and we can continue there. Um, yes, indeed. Um, hello, Lizzie. Thank you very much. And I think that um, uh, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. Two points, basically. I think that uh, Frank and everybody here tuned in, we will all agree that one of the most difficult things we confront in fragile states is lack of data. I have not seen a rigorous economic data nor should I expect to see on households and firms disaggregated, the role of women in our communities, et cetera, et cetera. So data is pivotal. Uh, why is that important? Well, we're in 2021, and so technology. We should not ignore the role of technology, mobile phones, and how we can use the new technologies to have access to data that until now, we were not able to. So that's one point going forward in terms of um, uh, uh, fragile states. And of course, second point, we tend to think obviously on state level and therefore interventions are driven by country specific interventions. International cooperation at a time when there were tremendous challenge towards globalization and international cooperation. Africa marched in solidarity. If in doubt, see what the African, Africa CDC has done during the COVID, right? And so our interventions should also focus on continental and regional efforts. Uh, many of the conversations we could have on the Sahel or in the Horn of Africa, it would be very difficult to have those conversations without regional entities. And we all know that many of these regional entities desire uh, uh, support and strengthen uh, to capacitate them. So beyond the state level in the continent, I think these continental and regional entities should not be forgotten in any interventions we think about. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for raising the point about data that hasn't been mentioned. I've spent the last 15 years of my life collecting data in uh, conflict <laughs> zones, sometimes with the World Bank, <laughs> but we're still not there. Um, Adnan. Thank you. Uh, two points. So one about prioritization and sequencing. Uh, so one piece of advice, rather than thinking of grand strategies that can move fragile countries in one big leap to Denmark, 
I think we should be thinking about concrete, feasible steps, uh, actions that can take these countries step by step towards greater capacity, greater uh, growth, and greater legitimacy, and focus on those uh, for each for each country. In other words, move to the uh, move the frontier and then um, move the frontier up as well. Uh, one comment on corruption. Uh, we should focus on corruption when it becomes a major cause of uh, fragility and underdevelopment, when it has macro consequences. And there's the role of the international community there also. Don't give aid alone to, to, to the Mobutus of the world, uh, but also uh, in terms of like tax havens and, and uh, uh, ownership registries and a number of other things, uh, some of which are happening, actually happening. Uh, but also there is an obsession with corruption. Um, which is sometimes unhelpful. Uh, um, if it is seen in terms of uh, rents uh, that promote growth, uh, that become grease in the system for promoting economic growth, uh, in the context of this book, um, maybe uh, maybe we need to think differently. Uh, but I would also say that uh, the obsession with with corruption in many cases also generates more unintended consequences, uh, more harm than good. Uh, in my own work, I can uh, I can show that uh, uh, the cure is often worse than the than the disease. And while we should think about corruption, uh, we should also think about uh, the unintended consequences of corruption control measures. Let me stop. Absolutely right. Um, so now, with all one minute over the time, but if I could ask all of you to stay for another few minutes uh, uh, with us, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists and all the participants for the great questions and for the great interventions. And I will pass on to Kunal, who will close this uh, webinar. Thank you so much for everyone. Thanks, Patricia. I was actually also going to thank everyone who's taken part in this panel. So I was going to thank Eric Hook, uh, for well, uh, my long-term co-author for the policy guidebook and presentation, Patricia for very ably um, chairing the panel, and of course, uh, um, panelists Anan, Aloysius, Anke, Frank, and Nicole for your very insightful comments and for a very lively panel discussion that we had uh, today. Uh, I also should mention that Eric and I received some great feedback for, on our framework and the policy guidebook from colleagues in the UK's FCTO. We had a workshop with them uh, in February of this year. And thanks very much for our colleagues there for really, which has really enhanced the framework and, 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 uh, and, and, the, and the guidebook itself. And I just want to end by saying that, that the policy guidebook is just one part of wider's extensive work on, on conflict, just one part. Uh, Patricia herself is leading a major project on institutional legacies of violent conflict. And you have more details on the, on the website. Uh, lots of exciting work coming out soon uh, in the next year or so. So look, look, uh, do look at our website for publication and working papers on, on the on the project. Our first of our first major conference next year is on conflict, and that's the dates are 16th and 17th May. So please keep an eye out for calls and uh, information about the about the conference uh, closer to the, to the time. Um, so we, that's going to be very exciting. Hopefully, all of you will be there for that for that conference. Um, thanks to everyone who attended the event, and I hope to see all of you in a future wider event um, very shortly. Thanks. Thank you so much.